<coughs> thank you very much for the invitation. It's been too long since I've been up in Milwaukee. Uh, I always have fun when I come. Um, and I want to apologize for the you know, insanely vague topic. I had no idea what I wanted to talk about and kept changing my mind all last week. So I uh, just made up some words. I think I'll try to include them all at least once. So what I am going to talk about is maybe just a random set of topics in geometric group theory and geometric topology that I think are interesting, um, loosely tied together with the framework of a discussion of sort of quasi-isometric geometry, which is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, so, uh, right, I'm going to do this in a very old-fashioned way. Uh, but if you need more volume or larger font size or or anything, just tell me, and I will try to accommodate you. Oh, the red doesn't work? Sure. All right. So, right, so I'm going to start with stuff that I'm sure most of you have seen many times before, and even infinitely many times before, so here's one of my keywords done. Um, so, I like to start by thinking about this in terms of some of the first theorems you see in what I think of as geometric topology, just something like the classification of compact surfaces. Okay. And because I can't draw very well, we're only going to talk about orientable ones. <coughs> and you learn there's the sphere. And there's a torus. And then maybe the one you didn't think of. And then you can keep going, just adding on more tori to this picture as long as you like. And that's just a complete list of all the compact orientable surfaces. Now it's, it's always a harder theorem than I think it's going to be when I try to prove it for undergraduates. But it's not that big a deal, and it's basically combinatorial. Now, when you try to study these surfaces, all of a sudden it turns out somehow that I needed to put a line here and a line here because the sphere is somehow different from the torus, which is somehow different from all the higher genus surfaces, and all of those are largely the same in some sense or another. And right, so there's uniformization. Which is even harder when I try to prove it for undergraduates, but still doable. Right, which says that all these surfaces have metrics of constant curvature. Or maybe said a little differently, the way I want to think of it here is their universal covers are S2, R2, or H2. Um, All right, and this is not surprisingly the two sphere is, is the two sphere. Uh, the torus is, of course, a quotient R2 by Z2. And then all of these are the hyperbolic plane modulo some discrete group of isometries of the hyperbolic plane, uh, which group depends on which surface you drew here. And I'm not sure that picture has constant negative curvature. Anyway, so this is all sort of nice and unfortunately very misleading if you want to think about high dimensional manifolds because nothing like this possibly works in high dimension, which is sort of disappointing. Um, I guess something like this does sort of work in dimension three and I will uh, mention some things about that as we go on. But The 
first observation I want to make is that you don't really need to do all of this really hard analysis that's involved in getting a metric of honestly constant negative curvature to tell somehow that there are these three different families here that are fundamentally different from each other but similar to the other members of their family. Um, So maybe I'll just say it this way. For example, any metric at all you put on T2, right, as R2 mod Z2, gives a, in fact, Z squared periodic. Metric on R2. which is by Lipschitz equivalent to the standard Euclidean metric. Because okay. whatever metric you put on the torus, well, it's still the torus. There's some, uh, the identity map from that to the flat torus is locally it's smooth, it's by Lipschitz. Torus is compact, so there's some global bound on the by Lipschitz constant that passes upstairs when you pass the universal covers. So even if you put some crazy metric, like the one I actually drew there from rotating a circle around in three space or something, the metric you get on the plane when you look at the universal cover is still by Lipschitz equivalent to the one you would have found by knowing that there was a flat metric. Okay. And there's nothing special about the torus here. Likewise, any metric on the surface of genus 2. Right, and now, I must admit, I don't know what to call the universal cover of the surface of genus 2 when I'm pretending I don't know what it is. Because I'm torn between R2 and H2. Um, I'll call it, well, I know what to call it. There. So on the universal cover of the surface of genus 2, which is by Lipschitz equivalent to the hyperbolic plane. Again, for the same reason, the identity map from the surface with whatever metric you gave it to the surface with whichever hyperbolic metric you want to pick on it has some by Lipschitz constants. When you pass the universal cover, they're still by Lipschitz because there's a co-compact symmetry group. Um, now, so let me point out, for instance, that one consequence, say, of being by Lipschitz to the Euclidean metric is that the volume of the ball of radius r is something like r squared. It may not be pi r squared anymore if you've chosen a different metric. But right, the ball of radius r and whatever this crazy metric is up here contains the ball of radius r over k and is contained in the ball of size uh, k times r, depending on what your bilipsis constants are. You still end up with something that's growing essentially quadratically in r. Okay? And here, the volume of the ball of radius r grows exponentially. So you can use some fairly crude uh, geometric invariance of the universal covers with whatever metric you want to write down, not necessarily this one you find via uniformization, to tell that there's something different going on between the torus and the surface of genus 2. Okay. Now, it's uh, less obvious that the thing you get on the universal cover of the surface of genus 2 and the thing you get on the universal cover of the surface of genus 3 are in fact by Lipschitz to one another unless you somehow find a common finite cover or some such scheme. Uh, but they are. As of course we know via uniformization because they're all just the hyperbolic plane. So all right, and since this generalizes to all manifolds, you give me any manifold 
it'll have a well-defined bilatrix class of compact manifold, have a well-defined bilatrix class of metric. In fact, even if it's not smoothable, but that's a different talk, the universal cover then has some well-defined bilatrix class of metric. And one could study sort of open manifolds up to bilatrix equivalents to try to get some kind of analog of this nice division in dimension two into these three families that we know control a lot of the behavior. Um, however, that uh, still only works for manifolds. Right? You still need to know that your thing is a manifold. Uh, you need to know that any two Riemannian metrics are locally given by inner products on Rn, and inner products on Rn are always by Lipschitz equivalent because there's only the one. So, in fact, you can relax your idea of what a metric is and get an even softer statement that still allows you to do this argument and in fact allows you to talk about things that aren't manifolds in a similar way. And the context for that, at least the one I want to talk about, are so-called complete, uh, that's not important really, geodesic, uh, proper uh, metric spaces. Okay, so you better be a metric space if I'm going to talk about putting a metric on it. Um, complete, just because if your metric space isn't complete, you might as well complete it. We're really only interested in compact objects anyway. So I'll put that in there. Um, think of these as playing the role of the universal cover. Okay, so we're not talking about the compact objects, we're talking about their universal covers here. So these are non-compact, complete metric spaces. So the two words that are maybe less familiar, proper just means that closed balls are compact. Okay, so one holdover we need from talking about manifolds is that we need some sort of local compactness, finite dimensionality built into our picture to make things work out. And the bigger restriction here is geodesic, which means that I want to know that uh, the distance between two points is in fact the infimum over paths P from A to B of the length of P. Okay, so you want to look at paths that you keep subdividing, add up the distances, take some limit, get this rectifiable curve with some well-defined length. And I want to know that I can in fact find paths between any two points uh, which come as, at least as close to the distance as I want. So if the infimum of the, the lengths of paths gives me the, the distances. Now this is, uh, if you're a point set topologist, this is probably the condition that's going to make you mad because I just made your space path connected, locally path connected, and otherwise boring. So um, we're not quite in the world of manifolds here, but locally everything is very tame from a topological point of view. Right? Balls around x, if this is a ball of radius whatever, epsilon, of course, by definition, I can connect any two points inside of here to x by paths that are linked significantly less than epsilon. So they have to stay entirely inside the ball. That's why everything is, the balls are basically star-shaped and certainly path-connected and almost convex in some reasonable way. So these are fairly nice metric spaces. On the other hand, they're, there is certainly no restriction on uh, the local topology in the way there is for, for manifolds. Um, so for example, any locally finite, well, any, this way, uh, any, any, comp any finite simplicial complex So 
if you give me any simplicial complex, each of the simplices is just abstractly a simplex, but there's one standard regular simplex in Euclidean space which has a metric. Okay. I can just put that metric on every single simplex and then define the distance between points as the minimum lengths of paths where I just decompose my path to pass from one simplex to the next. And that certainly gives me a metric space that ends up being of this type. Okay. So uh, for any of the spaces one regularly deals with um, in algebraic topology, any of the finite complex type spaces one deals with in algebraic topology will also fit into this picture. So it's very far from the manifold world. And in fact, taking combinatorial gadgets and giving them sort of metric and then thinking about what geometric properties they might or might not have uh, has been a very fruitful vehicle for translating a lot of machinery from uh, combinatorial group theory and old combinatorial topology into sort of a geometric topology framework. Um, I guess I'll mention one more. So in particular, any graph of bounded valence. I'm going to forget words like this all the time any connected graph is that visible doesn't really matter it says connected um, any connected graph of bounded valence right is a proper geodesic metric space we're here we're just thinking about the edges as one simplices is just having length one so we're just recording path length in this graph essentially all right. So, so there's a so-called fundamental theorem of geometric group theory, which maybe gets, the, uh, gets to be the easiest of the fundamental theorem of things that I know of. Uh, fundamental theorem of calculus is pretty hard. Fundamental theorem of projective geometry, which we may discuss, is also hard. Uh, fundamental theorem of algebra is really hard. I don't know. Anyway. Um, what does it say? It says that, you know, a lot of different ways of phrasing this, I'll say it this way. Given uh, any finitely generated group, gamma, there is uh, a well-defined uh, quasi-isometry class spaces. I realize I didn't define that yet. We'll come back to it in a minute. <coughs> also, from now on when I say spaces, I'm talking about proper geodesic metric space. I don't want to keep writing it down every time. Um, among this class of spaces that we're signaling out, signaling out to correspond to gamma are any space you can dream up that gamma acts on properly and co-compactly uh, by isometries. So this is related to what we were talking about over there in the sense that any universal cover with any of the metrics you lifted from the base now has the fundamental group acting by covering transformations properly and co-compactly by isometries on whatever this weird Riemannian manifold you got is. And all of those spaces fall into the same quasi-isometry class that's being singled out from the group. Okay. Um. Where do I want to write this down?
So essentially, the picture here is just sort of the classical uh, way one approximates a space by a simplicial complex, taking the nerve of some covering. All we're going to do is take our mystery x that has some gamma acting on it properly discontinuously and co-compactly by isometries. Inside of here, there's a ball of some radius depending on all the constants involved, whose translates cover the whole space. Okay. It's what co-compactly means, given that balls are, are compact. So now we just take this thing. Here's x. Here's a translate. Here's another translate. Maybe here's another one. And we just cover the space by all of these balls translated around by our group action. Okay, they're all centered at the points of the gamma orbit of this base point we pick. And then we just look at this graph you get by going ahead and connecting up any two balls that overlap. And this builds some graph that sort of runs throughout the space. It certainly fills up the whole thing because the action is co-compact. Uh, because the action is proper, no translate of x comes too close to x, okay? unless it actually is x, so exactly on top. I think it's the same point. So, uh, and moreover, what are the gammas that are adjacent to our base point? Well, they're exactly those elements of the group that move this ball to not be disjoint from itself. Just to say, they move the base point within 2r of the base point which is a finite set because the action is properly discontinuous. Okay. So this is a, this graph inside of here gives right, a locally finite, in fact, uniformly bounded valence graph okay, uh, with transitive, the vertex transitive. gamma action that uh, approximates our space x. This is our combinatorial model for how we're going to approximate x. And then what quasi-isometry means is basically just whatever we need to make approximating mean to make this actually true. To say that this graph really does approximate x. All right, so what do we need to know? Well. We're just going to think of taking these balls and mapping them down to the individual vertices. Um, so one point, of course, is that x, uh, we're mapping x to the vertex set, which usually we will be. Um, we're mapping an uncountable space, typically, since it's geodesic, to a countable set of points. Right? It's not one to one. Uh, maybe that's the fundamental theorem of set theory. I'm not sure. but so whatever our definition of equivalent in this sense is, it can't include being one to one. Okay. What we ask for um, is we say x and y are quasi-isometric. Okay, and maybe I should put some constants in here. K, okay, C, quasi-isometric. A bunch of different ways of saying this all. Say it this way, if there are maps f from x to y and g from y to x, as usual, we want equivalence to mean they're sort of inverse maps. Okay, but I said it can't be one to one, so these aren't literally inverse maps. But they're almost inverses. These compositions aren't quite inverses, but they don't move points very far. So essentially what we're saying in this picture is precisely what's going on inside one of these balls. Uh, we're going to throw away all that information completely. We're recording it with a point. So 
the exact details of where the points are within this ball or what topology there might be inside this ball is going to disappear in our approximation. Is there be a case somewhere? Yeah, so I didn't write the whole condition yet. Oh, sorry. This is, <laughs> so this is just the point, fact that the maps are, are basically inverses. Okay. Um, the other condition And you can put a plus C on here, although it's not really necessary since I'm only writing the, the condition this way, but it's traditional. Okay, so again, these maps look, if we left the C off, we'd just be saying these maps are Lipschitz. Right? And in fact, if C is zero all the way throughout, this says these two maps are Lipschitz, and this says they're inverses. So we'd be precisely saying that these are bi Lipschitz spaces. Uh, we're weakening that a little bit to throw away all the local topology. I find a very funny phrase. What does global topology mean exactly? But anyway, uh, that's what we're doing. What's happening inside a ball is just being thrown away completely because distances on a smaller scale than C just get swamped by the adding C. And they're largely irrelevant to, to all of these conditions. And then. Leave it as an exercise for you to check that indeed this graph uh, is quasi-isometric to this whole space X under these assumptions. You just take, essentially the only non-trivial thing you have to do is take two points in X, draw the path between them, and then track it with balls that cover the path efficiently to get a combinatorial path in the graph that isn't dramatically longer than the, the geodesic in X. Does this make sense? Are there questions? Everybody asleep already because they've seen this a million times? Math, math doesn't mean continuous. No, no. Well, continuous in the non-local sense, yes. No, but yeah, there is, in, as I say, in fact, um, you know, the typical example to be thinking of here is just the z squared sitting inside of R2, right, as the usual lattice points. Right, we can include this in. That's a perfectly good continuous reasonable map. Mapping backwards from R2 to Z2 is a little bit harder to do continuously in a non-constant way. But if we just tile the plane by squares and collapse each square down to its center, we get a map that does what we want uh, and really only messes with the topology inside these small squares that are being collapsed. The larger structure of where the squares are is pretty much preserved. So the other thing to point out, um, I think this has come up a couple of times already, is that there is a construction here. There's a second half to that theorem, which doesn't just say that all the spaces gamma axon are quasi-isometric, I've proven to you, but in fact there is one as well. So there, there is in fact an appropriate quasi-isometry class. Um, and we've more or less said how to build it already in this picture. Right, having a graph that gamma acts on vertex transitively just means we have a graph. So I'll write down some symbols. This is the Cayley graph of gamma with respect to S, if those words mean anything to you. So what this is going to be is just a graph with vertex set equal to the group. Think of it as being the sort of orbit up in that picture. And so in this picture, S is the set of elements of the group. Uh, that move the base point within 2R so that the translate of the R ball overlaps itself. So it's adjacent to the base point in this picture. And then because the group is just acting by isometries preserving all the structure, what happens at any other, what's adjacent to any other vertex G1 is just the translate of that picture of what's adjacent to the identity. So it's G1 times any of these S that were adjacent to the identity. 
um, to make this actually a connected graph that is globally finite valence and all of the things we said we wanted, uh, it would be good if S needs to generate S. Okay, and for convenience, it's helpful to have inverses of elements of S in S. If you think through what happens in this particular example, all these things are satisfied by basic hypotheses. But if you write down, pick any finite generating set that does this, you get an example. You get a graph this way. The group pretty clearly acts by left translations on it with one orbit of vertex, uh, S orbits of edges. And so you've got an action of your group which is properly discontinuous and co-compact on, on one of these spaces that we like. So this is one representative of the quasi-isometry type of the group. Doesn't matter which generating set you pick. Um, you get different graphs with slightly different metrics, but they're all of the same quasi-isometry types as per the theorem, although that's a little bit easier. So this gives you some sort of map, right, from finitely generated groups. quasi-isometry classes spaces and we're hoping that this will be carry enough structure to mimic uh, sort of knowing about the uniformization theorem for surfaces and using the geometry of the plane or the hyperbolic plane of the sphere to study this fundamental group of the surface. Okay, so that's the that's the dream is that this is makes the uniformization theorem work for all finitely generated groups. Of course, it can't be that good. Um, but, all right, so when you have a new toy like this, uh, you want to know what it can do, more or less what it can't do. Um, if you're my kids, you want to break it as fast as possible. Um, so, When are two groups quasi-isometric to one another? We now have a map from groups to spaces. When do we get the same, same quasi-isometry class of space for two different groups? Okay. Um, and certainly we know from this theorem uh, that this happens if uh, they both act properly and co-compactly. by isometries on some x. Um, and in general, if we have two groups that are quasi-isometric and we can conclude that there's some reasonable x that they're both acting on properly discontinuously and co-compactly by isometries, which is at all reasonable, then we're pretty happy with what we've proven. We've, we've taken this sort of general categorical construction and used it to build some specific space that we can have both groups acting on simultaneously and use this to, to study them. Okay, so, uh, so for example, right, uh, okay, so if you have some Lie group that you like, and you have two discrete co-compact subgroups. Uh, think, okay, I erased my first slide already, but if you think about the hyperbolic plane with the fundamental group of uh, some uh, hyperbolic surface sitting inside of its isometry group, you've got a discrete co-compact subgroup of SL2C, SL2R. So I've been in three-manifold world too long. Um, but it doesn't really matter that this is, happens to be the isometric group of SL2R. This construction works in any group. In fact, it doesn't even really have to be a Lie group. I'm not going to wander off into topological group world too much. 
but in fact, uh, if you have a locally compact, compactly generated topological group, two discrete co-compact things in there will work as well. Again, for the same reason, you just need enough hypotheses on your topological group to make sure you can put some kind of invariant metric on it. Because it's at least close enough to geodesic to make these arguments work. Yeah, so sorry, maybe you said this a minute ago. But in the condition on the right, if you say there's a well-defined quasi isometry class that includes the spaces on which gamma acts properly, just right. properly go compactly. But as written, that doesn't say that gamma acts on everything. That no, and in fact, it doesn't. So is, so is it possible to have uh, a quasi isometry class in which you get the same groups, but there's no single space on which both of them acts? Yes, I mean, um, so of course, if you get the same group, it will of course act simultaneously with itself on any space it acts on. Okay, so, but it, you can have two different groups in the same quasi-isometry class that do not manage to act simultaneously on anything. Okay, that's one of the, uh, so that's why it says if and not only if here. It would, be, it would be lovely if that were true. Unfortunately, you know, the, the statement Gamma 1 and gamma 2 simultaneously act properly and co-compactly by isometries on some reasonable x. Turns out not to be an equivalence relation. And it generates some equivalence relation, which probably isn't quasi-isometry either. But uh, quasi-isometry is at least uh, a fairly geometrically straightforward equivalence relation, uh, which at least includes all of, all of those. Okay. Um, and in fact, I should say, I'll discuss a lot of cases where we know what's going on, um, sort of cheating. We really only know what's going on in some very isolated pockets of the universe where we have a good handle on the geometry of things. Um, and we don't really know much in general about how bad quasi-isometries can be or what quasi-isometry classes can look like uh, in, the, in the full generality that we've got over here. So what do I want to say? Oh, right. So I'll mention that uh, oh, okay, I gotta go faster. All right, so I will mention here in particular a group and a finite index subgroup are always quasi-isometric. Of course, you can restrict the action of the big one on anything <coughs> to the small one. And you've got a properly discontinuous and co-compact action of both of them on the same thing. The same is true for a group and its quotient by any finite normal subgroup because you can just make the big group act by factoring through the small group. And because the kernel is finite, a proper action of the quotient is a proper action of the whole thing. So there's some basic algebra here which uh, sort of systematically ignores finite index phenomena, uh, quotienting by finite groups or passing the finite index subgroups, which comes up over and over again. Um, it's usually called commensurable. Unfortunately, Turns out there are lots of different ways you can make precise what you mean by commensurable, and they're all algebraically a little bit different. Um, so I'm not going to pick one. But if I say commensurable, it's something about finite index. And if you are curious about the details any particular time I say it, please feel free to ask. Um, there are some cases that are easy. Being quasi-isometric to the trivial group, and this is exactly the same thing as saying that the group is finite. Um, and if you have a map to a single point here, these conditions immediately tell you that that means the diameter of your space is bounded. And when you have a discrete group of bounded diameter, it's finite. Okay. Uh, the answer, by the way, to this question is, of course, yes, there. Every finite group acts properly discontinuously and co-compactly on a point. Um, maybe the next interesting case where we actually see something. What about things quasi-isometric to Z, or if you prefer to think in terms of spaces, you can think about being quasi-asymmetric to the real line. 
Um, right, so there are lots of ways to, to settle this question. Maybe I won't pretend to keep you in suspense. This is the same thing as uh, gamma has uh, an infinite cyclic subgroup of finite index. So we are indeed just talking about sort of the obvious things that are z extended by some finite things. It's right. These groups are also more mysterious than I expect them to be every time I talk about them. I mean, do they all act on R or not? We've got a space we know how to act on by Z, by isometries, giving you a class of groups all quasi isometric to that. Are they all going to act or not? It's finite normal subgroup doesn't cause any problems, but if I take a finite extension of Z, can I make all those elements act? And there's, a, there's some topology in that question. Uh, and some of it's the same thing you have to do to answer this. And it's related to a question about how do you even know what all compact one manifolds are? Right? There's just a circle. So we are led to believe. And uh, certainly if they're all the circle, then they all have fundamental group Z and, and everything fits into this picture. But how do you classify all compact one manifolds? Or how do you classify what all the homeomorphisms of R look like? And you can mimic most any one of those arguments uh, to do this in the quasi-isometric category. Let me just say uh, maybe a little bit here. So first of all, right, R has an ordering. And the ordering on R is what determines the topology. It's where most of these arguments go, right? Your homeomorphisms have to be monotonically increasing or decreasing and you iterate and look at orbits and where they could accumulate and so forth. Now, of course, um, you know, if f from r to itself is a KC quasi-isometry, uh, of course, need not preserve the order. It can do whatever it wants on the small scale. But <coughs> If you think about the product R times R, here's our diagonal copy of R. If you look only at pairs, say, x comma y, with the distance between x and y, say, much bigger than c, some number, stick with it, then right, we're getting rid of some band around the diagonal, looking at these two different sides left over, and those two components are basically what's encoding our order. One component is where x is bigger than y, one component is where x is smaller than y. Okay. <coughs> and it's not so hard to convince yourself that as long as we've pick and, taken c to be big enough, our quasi-isometry can't, well, either it consistently takes everything on this side and slips it with this side, or it leaves everything alone. Okay. Because if you take, maybe I'll get a different color, If you take two, oh, someone said not to use red. If you take two different points here, say x1, y1, and x2, y2, both of which are far from the diagonal, say in the same component, and you connect them by some path, and look at what the quasi-isometry does to that path. Well, it needn't leave it a continuous path, but it doesn't make any gigantic jumps, right? Because two points that are close together in this path have to map to within something not much bigger than C. In particular, there is no hope of the steps along this path managing to make one of these jumps across the sides. Okay, so one can do some sort of discrete approximation of a, conti a continuity argument to tell you that, uh, in fact, such a map is Okay, 
if we pick off the orientation preserving a reversing quality of homeos of R this way, or the map to Z2 from the isometry group of R, okay, that, that persists on the quasi-isometry level. And maybe I won't go into as much detail as I had planned here for the sake of time, but you can push through uh, the rest of the argument about sort of monotonically increasing functions and so forth. Similarly, you see that once you have sort of one quasi-isometry of R that moves any point really quite far from itself and is orientation preserving in this coarse sense, its iterates just have to march steadily along the real line. And that directly gives you a Z subgroup that's already acting co-compactly, so to speak. Okay. So I slipped into slightly different language. So let me finish by, I'm mostly out of time, by just mentioning what that says. And then we'll pick this up next time. Because this is a workshop, I also want to mention a couple of things we don't know here at the end. So, so imagine you're in the situation where you're given some nice x, say the real line, or some space that you think you understand pretty well. Okay? And and a mystery gamma quasi-isometric to x. And we want to know what is this fact that this mystery group is quasi-isometric to x that we supposedly like tell us about the group. Okay, so it's more or less the same question I had written down before, just phrased in a very biased way against groups in four spaces. Um, now, so the, the nice answer would be that gamma acts properly discontinuously and co-compactly by isometries on x and we're done. Okay, unfortunately that's just not true. Um, but there is something like that that's true. Okay. You take your gamma, which we can think of as acting on itself or on its Cayley graph. Okay. You've got your quasi-isometry over to x, okay, and the inverse quasi-isometry back to gamma. I can try to force the gamma action over to x. All right, I take a point of x, I move it over via my qi to something. Okay. Let me give these maps names, say f of x. Okay. If you give me gamma in gamma, I can then act by gamma on that point. Okay. And then I can ask, what does that point correspond to over here? Okay, so if, we, if f and g were really, say, inverses and by, you know, if these were by Lipschitz equivalents or something, I would just be conjugating the action of gamma on one side over to gamma on the other. And we'd see essentially the same action of gamma on x, just with the by Lipschitz change from the one we saw over here. Fortunately, these maps aren't actually inverses. Okay. So we don't really get an action. Okay. We get what's called a quasi-action. And so it's not hard to write down what the axioms for such a thing are. Right? There are k and c, and then some assignment uh, for all gamma and gamma, f sub gamma, kc quasi-isometry. Of x. Okay, so uh, maybe f is a bad letter. Let's call it rho gamma. So I'll call this rho gamma. It's a map. It sends any point of x to a different point of x. It's trying to be acting by gamma. Um, you know, it's just a composition of three things, two of which are quasi-isometries with whatever constants they have. Gamma is actually isometric, so it doesn't make the constants any worse. Um, so all of these things, independent of which, what gamma we're looking at, are quasi-isometries with the same constant. Um, You know, the distance from rho of the identity to the actual identity map is bounded by some amount. That's just saying you take x, go to f of x, do nothing, and go back via g. They were approximately inverse. So this whole process hasn't moved x more than some 
for the bounded amount, and for all gamma 1 and gamma 2, similarly, So all of this is saying it looks like an action if you're willing to pretend that things that are distant smaller than c are really equal. Right? So the identity doesn't really act by the identity. The composition really doesn't act exactly like the composition. Okay? But to within some uniformly bounded distance across all the elements of the group and all the points of the space, they do. And that's about the best we can do in this category where the local behavior of maps is, is more or less arbitrary. And you can then uh, translate fairly straightforwardly the statement that uh, gamma is quasi-isometric to x into gamma has a quasi-action on x which looks properly discontinuous and co-compact. So if you use quasi-action in the place of action, in the place of isometric action, right, properly discontinuous is supposed to mean that the set of elements that move a given point, some bounded amount is finite doesn't really depend on the local structure. It's just a statement about what happens to large balls. And the co-compact, again, just means I can move any point reasonably close to any other point, okay, so that there's some big ball whose translates cover. Again, that actually is not sensitive to this fact that it's not an action. The exact radius of the ball that might cover would be. But, but the fact that it looks properly discontinuous and co-compact survives here, and in fact, this is equivalent to being quasi-isometric to x. And you can take any group quasi-isometric to x and make it act like this, and this argument about a group that acts co-compactly and properly discontinuously by isometries is quasi-isometric to x uh, proceeds the same way for quasi-action. It really doesn't care, just about the fact that the translates of these balls cover. So, <coughs> in a sense, this is an answer, although not a very good answer to the question of which groups are quasi-isometric to x. We'd like to get the quasi out of there. And maybe change x to a slightly nicer x and improve our quasi-action to an action. Okay. And that's, that's the general procedure for a lot of the rigidity results that we know. You take a group quasi-acting on your space and you try to improve that to an actual action on something at least quasi-isometric to your space. Um, how much time do I have? So I'll say you can, right. you can always mindlessly do it if you're willing to make the mystery space you act on sufficiently bad. Okay. You have to leave the locally finite category. Okay. And here's, a, here's an amusing example, at least it amuses me. It occurs if you try to do something with the real line a little bit too sloppily. So let x be a graph with the vertex set of x equal to the real numbers. Okay, so this is definitely not a reasonable looking graph. The edge set of x is all pairs x, y such that say, the distance is less than 1. So there are uncountably many vertices. Each has uncountably many edges coming out of it. On the other hand, this is certainly quasi-isometric to the real line with the obvious map. Okay. Um, but the thing I find amusing is, this is something you can do if you're bored during my next talk. What does the isometry group of something like this look like? If it were just the reals or something close-ish to the reals, we'd be happy. Okay. Unfortunately, because this is not a locally compact, locally finite graph, the isometry group need not be a locally compact group. In fact, uh, I'll give you a hint that it's not. Um, so, uh, you know, the, somehow the whole, the whole issue in most of these things is how nice can you make this space that you have to act on if you're, if you're quasi-isometric to x. In the case of the reals, which I didn't finish, the answer is the reals. If you're quasi-isometric to R, you act on R. Um, that's, in fact, the answer for a lot of the sort of traditional geometries that we know locally symmetric spaces of various kinds and, and so forth. But uh, yeah, I guess I'm out of time. So I will, I'll pick this up next time and give you 
sort of a, a not too hard generalization of this that, that, address, that also provides some weird examples of quasi isometries. I should uh, thank the earlier speaker for mentioning generalized bomb stock solitar groups. That'll save me a couple of boards later because their QI classifications is accessible and amusing. And it was one of the actually early sort of triumphs because somehow the bomb stock solitar groups are traditional monsters from the combinatorial group theory world. They're not residually finite, they do bad things. Turns out from a geometric group theory point of view, they're, they're really quite tame. And we can analyze what's happening. So I'll try to talk about that and some issues related to the geomet geometrization conjecture of the three manifolds, uh, how this works out for some <coughs> more complicated geometries next time. So the yeah, just make all edges link one. Okay. Or the graph automorphisms if you want instead of isometries. All right, I promised you, uh, right, I should say this because I always say this. Um, it's been around since I don't know how close to the beginning of all of this. But to give you another example about what we don't know once things get a little weird, if you take Z with all the powers of 2 as a generating set, so this is an infinite generating set, so we're not. We're not getting something quasi-asymmetric to Z in the usual sense here. And compare it to, say, the infinite generating set, which is just all the powers of 3. So we're asking, take integers and decide how big they are based on how many powers of 2 you need to use to write them, or how many powers of 3 you need to use to write them. And it's not even trivial to see that the identity map is not a quasi-isometry, um, but it's not. It's not known at all whether these things are, in fact, quasi-isometric. Okay, and this, you know, anything that looks anything like this, so any sort of infinite torsion groups or these Grigorchuk monsters or any honestly strange groups, really, uh, we probably have no idea what anything quasi-isometric to them looks like. But I will try to explain some of the cases where we do in the next lecture.